Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Tracy Abel, Chief Operating Officer here at American College of Healthcare Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Beyond the Cap Conversations and Complementary Alternative Medicine Conference. This is our first session, and joining us this morning is Sarah Wells, an ACHS graduate. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. First, joining us today behind the scenes is our technical guru, Andy Pearson, and he is manning our go-to webinar today. For those of you joining us online, you may have noticed that your line has been muted. We are recording today's session, and that will protect the recording. You'll notice that you have a control panel at the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question for the presenter during the webinar, please type your question into the questions box, and we will have time at the end of the session for questions and answers. And of course, if you're here on campus, you're welcome to raise your hand at any time and ask our presenter a question. The presenter will repeat the question for the benefit of our online audience. If you have any further questions um, that require a bit more depth to the answer, you'd like to connect with today's speaker, please email us at info at achs.edu and we'll facilitate you getting in touch with the presenter. Now I want to introduce you to our first speaker, ACHS graduate Sarah Wells. Sarah is a 2018 graduate of the ACHS Master of Science in Complementary Alternative Medicine program and the Graduate Certificate in Herbal Medicine. Her presentation today is on seven medicinal herbs of Southeast South Dakota. She shared in her introduction, while herbal medicine and other CAM methods continue to gain popularity and use, so too does the commerce of medicinal herbs, plants, and remedies across the globe. Sarah's presentation will highlight seven herbs from South Dakota, not only for their traditional and contemporary uses, but also because they have been studied in modern scientific research. So now please welcome Sarah Wells. Good morning, Portland and beyond. My name is Sarah Wells and I'm really happy to be here um, presenting to experts and colleagues in the field of complementary alternative medicine. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak in front of you uh, and to learn from you. Um, to, to, both, to both elders who have helped me along the way in getting here and to academics and experts that have helped me achieve my degree here at the American College of Healthcare Sciences. I'll talk a little bit today about seven significant medicinal plants native in Southeast South Dakota, where I'm from. Um, but first, a little bit about me. I have a background in um, conservation. I've done some training with the, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and then before and since my degree have been, have been working at local museums and the uh, River Appreciation Day, where we teach sixth graders uh, about the river, the Missouri River, how to appreciate it and plants and animals. Um, I, I continue education and outreach at the Vermilion Area Farmers Market and the um, Vermilion Area Community Garden. I'm also a South Dakota Master Gardener, and so continuing education is a big part of that. Um, it, from my studies going forward, I would like to do a little bit more, or I have an interest in aromatherapy and advocating safety in the United States for aromatherapy. Um, I would like to work with and learn more about homeopathy. Those are a couple of fields that I've learned about in my degree, but I have not been able to specialize in or learn much, much about. And then um, in sustainability, I would really like to, to learn more about the aspects of native plant use and, um, you know, like the carbon footprint of doing otherwise. A little bit about me. I call this my campaign, my campaign slide <laughs> in this political season. But I do approve this message. <laughs> um, the greatest, the greatest gift and the greatest work, of course, of my life is being a mother. Wow, <laughs> I didn't realize they're there, larger than life uh, behind me. That's my daughter, Matea. She lives in Los Angeles. She loves California. Addison and Oliver, 10 and 6, and then me, mommy. So. Um, and then just a little bit before I talk about 
my paper, I want to revisit why I came to ACHS. Um, I was really interested in learning about medicinal plants and herbs. I was reaching out to elders and attending ethno-botanical seminars and just, just learning about the plants in my neighborhood. And the more I would talk with people, like as we all know, people like to talk about their health and their ailments and they're searching for answers. But at the same time, the more I would talk to people, the more I realized that many, many people are on pharmaceuticals as a daily basis and not just one, but more than one. And so my fear was is that I would learn some really good things and then prescribe my great aunt uh, T that totally took away the what her pharmaceutical was trying to do or built the chemicals up in her body and caused detrimental, you know, to cause harm to her ultimately. So as much as I believe in staying rooted to the earth and learning traditional ways, uh, it's it's also a, a responsible reality that we need to be aware of the pharmaceuticals that people are taking and what's going on in the modern world that may or may not complement or contradict um, or simply negate all herbal herbal remedies. And I, I, I wanted to say alternative or traditional, and I really look at traditional as you know, the foundation of medicine and alternative medicine as kind of the new traditional, because we, in a lot of ways, we're going back to what people have known for thousands of years. Um, and then coming from South Dakota, I, I live in Vermilion, South Dakota. Um, it's a, I, I have family and friends and, and I'm learning as best I can about tribal traditions. And I've learned something about um, this, this Mitaku, Mitaku Yasin concept, which means all my relations. And the more I understand, the more I'm seeing that that doesn't just mean you and me as people. It also means uh, the earth and the plants and the animals and the people and how we work together as uh, partners in an ecosystem or uh, community members in a shared ecosystem. So it, I'm, it's not my place to teach uh, Lakota tradition or um, tribal tradition, but I do very much feel like it's my responsibility to pay deference to the tribes and the peoples that were there before before my own um, and to learn as much as possible because going forward, I think that's, that's where we've got to start. Okay, that said, what do I mean when I talk about native plants? Um, native does mean peoples, it does mean earth, it does mean animals. Um, it, it, more or less, it's groups that have been established in an area for give or take 500 years or more. Um, the NRCS defines uh, native plants as being hundreds of thousands or thousands of years in a particular region. And that 500 year definition seems to apply when, when I've looked at it to people and to soil and to animals as well. Um, and also the, the NRCS defines native as prior to European settlement in the United States. Okay, so why do I have an interest in using native plants? Well, <clears throat> that's mostly because, like I said, I wanna pay deference to the, the area in which I live. Um, that ecosystem has been going on a long time before the arrival of really any sorts of uh, groups of people. Um, and I wanted to pay respect to the plants that were there before and the ways and the peoples that have learned to work together. Um, also in, in some ways, immigrants that came over pushing westward learned some of these traditions, brought some of their own, adapted, uh, and then I'm also seeing lately how some of that's being lost. I have a, a reference book that that's from 1931. It's over, it's like a thousand pages and it's called the new herbal traditional or modern herbal. And to me going from there to a hundred years later, I think that we're losing a bunch of that, a bunch of the knowledge that's been established. Mm -hmm. um, also using native plants to me means a little bit like the locavore movement um, where if you use things that are native to your area, you're, you're becoming an ecosystem participant in your neighborhood. Um, 
it contributes to sustainability and self-sufficiency. So it's really easy these days to order something online and have it on your door the next day and who knows where it came from before that. And that increases the carbon footprint. So I mean, in sustainability standpoint, um, all the plants are right here, right now. Um, one reason that I looked at these, these plants as being um, viable in some of my studies, I would see that, you know, maybe this plant is being used widely as an alternative medicine or an herbal medicine all over the globe. And most, most plants have a cousin or a, a species that's right here native to the area in which you stand. So why not use the one that's right here? Um, sumac is a good example. In cooking, a lot of people use, you know, Mediterranean spice or Mediterranean Middle Eastern spices, well, we have stands and stands of sumac at home, and why not just use one of those instead of calling it up from abroad? So um, another reason I believe in using native plants is that they contain the synergy um, of the environment and of their own chemical constituents. So we all know about synergy and how many chemicals work together to make a whole better or to contribute to a, a healing process. Um, and using the plants in, that, in the environment in which you live, similarly to using honey from the environment in which you live, um, gives you the defenses of those plants that have already been built up and helps your own body sustain, uh, sustain itself and thrive in the, in the environment. Um, and also, again, because the plants are right there, there's, <laughs> they're right, they're right here around you, and you know, maybe maybe appreciating what we've got is a good is a good standpoint. Um, one of the seminars we did at River Appreciation Day this year for sixth graders, where we talked about plants. I, I remember standing on the road at the park next to the river, and to the right are fields and might be like just fields of soybeans with a couple plants here and there that might manage to survive uh, survive weed killing basically or spraying pesticides. And then to the left, when I'm talking about the students, to the left of the road in, a, in just like two or three feet, even if it looks like grass, there were dozens of different plants within the mown the mown lawn under our feet and then walk a couple couple more steps into the woods and you've, you've got thousands of things available to you so why not use what's there you know we live in an apartment where i where i live and around the building um i i could probably find enough uh, different plants to s sustain us to shelter us to you know feed us to, to help toward our healing just just within our building. It's really fascinating once you start to get to know the plants as neighbors around you. If I see a plantain outside our door uh, out of the blue one day, um, I start to think, well, what are plantains good for? Why is it here all of a sudden? Um, is it a weed or is it trying to tell me something? Is, if if somebody gets cut or burned in the next couple of days, I could go straight to that plant instead of driving across town to the to the nearest store to get ointment, for example. So, why use native plants as medicine? Because they're right there. They're they're part of where we live and who we are. So, just a little bit about Southeast South Dakota. Um, We've got the United States, of course. Here's South Dakota up there. Here's Southeast South Dakota, where the uh, Missouri comes together with the Big Sioux River and the James River goes down to the Mississippi River and out to the Gulf. Here's South Dakota. I live in Clay County. That's Yankton, Clay, and Union counties. And those are the, the counties I used for this paper, for this, uh, for this exploration of the plants around me, I should say. Um, it's, a, it's a temperate grassland biome in a humid continental climate akin to uh, African savanna or the steppes in Asia. It's grassland. Um, there's some forests where, let's see, there's some forests where we live. 
it's wooded in, in these areas, especially around the rivers. <clears throat> there's less hills there. There's um, great soil. It's really good farmland. Uh, but I prefer the prairie. <laughs> you know, I've been to a lot of majestic places in Portland. It's certainly one of the one of the more beautiful spots I've been at. But to me, this is home. And if you just look carefully and pay attention to what's around you, it's it's like a subtle beauty. You know, this is this was taken um, two days ago before I came here. And if you look, there's the river back here, and there's trees. And if you look in the lawn, there's a, a stand of sumac right there. There's grapes over there. It's just it's just really neat, and I would encourage anyone, you know, in their own ecosystems to just kind of zoom in and look closely at how things work together and how you're part of it. Um, the peoples I, I mentioned westward expansion of immigrants, but before that, it was. Uh, mainly the, the uh, lands of the Ocheti Shakoin, which are the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota peoples. Um, westward expansion of immigrants, unfortunately, also moved tribes westward. So the Lakota are more toward uh, the West River. Dakota is more around where we are. Nakota is more around where we are also. There are also other tribes in the area, but these are the main influences um, in my life and I, I believe of the area. Um, the more that the tribes moved west, of course, was a, a, a result of immig immigrants moving west from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa. Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, I think. And then, of course, before that, it was, it was Europe. And this is Dignity. She's a beautiful statue uh, on I-29 at the Chamberlain exit. She's also on my license plate. Okay, so what did I do to learn more? Well, when I was studying complementary alternative medicine, I noticed that some remedies or some herbs were present in different fields. So I noticed um, juniper, for example, was used in herbal medicine. Well, it is used in herbal medicine. It is used in aromatherapy. It is used in homeopathy. And there is um, some nutritional, definitely wildlife, um, definitely medicinal value to it. So I started picking up on some things like that that have really broad use. And in the example with juniper is that we, we don't call it juniper where, where I live. We call it eastern red cedar. And it's becoming, they, they call it like an invasive species. But to me, if, if it's native, I don't know if it can be really invasive. Um, it, it's abundant there. So why not use it more instead of, you know, outsourcing juniper berries, for example. Um, so that's what kind of led me on this journey. So what I wanted to do is, again, use plants that were native to the area, um, to southeast South Dakota where I lived. I wanted to scope out what was available, um, find out where, where their uses had evolved from or have been used uh, traditionally, see what's still being used traditionally, do some outreach that way, uh, see if it's being used in the, the modalities that I was studying here at ACHS in aromatherapy, homeopathy, nutrition. Uh, and then, you know, to boot, if it's good for the wildlife in the, in the area, it's good for me. Um, if it is not threatened and it's not endangered, if it's even better considered invasive, though native, um, or weedy, even better, because there's got to be a use for it if it's out there. And there's no reason to cut it down and then monocrop one thing in lieu of what's already made itself available uh, to us. And then, then, of course, the final combining in these worlds between traditional, the new traditional, and being able to talk to people um, is scientific research. And so the other, the other kind of criteria I had in looking up plants was that there's some modern scientific research available. So what I did was uh, I looked at the NRCS list of plants in South Dakota. There's like 10,000. Um, I eliminated or reduced that to what's native in Southeast South Dakota. And the NRCS came back with about 2,800, 
2,700 plants. And then from there, it wasn't really a process of elimination. What I did was try to get a broad range of things that were viable and interesting and um, useful and had traditional use and CAM use and research, like I previously mentioned. And it was hard. You know, if I could, I would pick all 3,000. But, you know, just writing about one is a book enough. You know, they're really, really interesting plants to get to know and to get to know the histories of. So I'm going to introduce you to the seven that I picked to highlight here um, as my significant, seven significant medicinal plants native in Southeast South Dakota. And by the way, I say native in, it might not be like the scientific approach, but I say native in because to me, South Dakota is not 500 years old you know, as a, as a geographic name. Um, so to me, the plants grew up and then South Dakota was kind of named a region around the plants, but maybe that's semantics. Maybe that's a really bad thing to do, but I like to say native in. So anyway, let me introduce you to sweetgrass, Eastern red cedar, smooth sumac, purple bee balm, common milkweed, thingy nettle, and horsetail. And again, I'm speaking to a, an audience of experts, but I'm gonna guess that even some of you look at those and think of weeds. Does anyone think? <laughs> what do you guys think of when you see those, see those plants? I think it's a great list. Uh, the only one I'm not really familiar with botanically is the smooth sumac. So. I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. Okay. Okay. It's a terrific list. You can pretty much do everything. Though. Yeah. You know, you know, the comment was we could do anything with those those plants, and I I agree. I wanted to pick, you know, just a handful that, given given the end of the world, we could we could thrive off of. So, and get to know better. And Julie, I seem to feel I'm not super familiar with this list. A lot of these are found in other places. Yeah. There's so a lot of these can be used in other parts of the country for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. A lot. Of, most of them are widely available. Although walking to campus this morning, I didn't recognize hardly any plants. So it's just a really thrilling kind of <laughs> kind of walk because usually I'm identifying things along the way and. I've got a lot to learn just based on the three block walk from the hotel to here. So anyway, I was thinking, you know, where I come from, people look at this list and generally do think, well, sumac's poisonous, or obviously we wet nettle is a weed or horsetail that grows along the river. You know, people don't give it a second thought. And, um, so me being the student and your student, I wanted to learn more about them and then just share a little bit with people about their uses and histories. So um, like I said, there's a lot to learn about each and every one, um, but I wanna just give you a, an introduction to each one today. So uh, let's see, one of, one of the other things that I looked at was the Dr. Duke's phytochemical and ethnobotanical databases. Um, so we talk about synergy, look at all the chemicals that are available in each of these plants. Um, sweetgrass, eastern red cedar, smooth sumac, purple bee balm, common milkweed, stinging nettle, and horsetail. There are dozens of, chemical, of chemicals present. There are hundreds of actions, um, and, and they lead to you know, dozens more uses traditionally the new traditional CAM, CAM wise homeopathy in homeopathy and aromatherapy in nutrition. So there's a lot. Um, so again, I just highlighted several for each plant just to kind of give you an idea of what each could be used for. Um, in each slide, I, I, uh, when I talk about the uses, there's one that's there's one that's highlighted kind of, or it's all in all caps for each. And so if, if anything's taken away, that seems to be one of the more viable uses across the board. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce you to sweetgrass. Does anyone know sweetgrass? I'm seeing, 
I'm like one yes and a bunch. Do you know sweetgrass? Here's sweetgrass. Oh my gosh. And it doesn't have, if you look back at the, at the chemical list and the actions, it didn't have like a ton like the others. But the reason I find sweetgrass um, one of the most important and where we're gonna start is because it helps purify the air. It helps cleanse the air. It helps calm the soul. And I burned a lot of sweetgrass in study <laughs> at ACHS. You know, it just helps in, a, in an aromatherapeutic way, if nothing else, helps one to feel better. So I'm gonna just light a little bit here today. Maybe. And this is um, grass that I grew at home and harvested at home and braided at home. And I want you to get a smell of it and just see if it does those things. And it's used widely in smudge sticks. Trying to burn down the campus tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. I got sweet. Well, this spray is for you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so yeah you're much. welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And you know, I just have a little patch of sweetgrass at home. So I wasn't able to burn a pretty, pretty, pretty one for everyone. But I did outsource some. <laughs> and then just little, but here's a sweetgrass braid for everybody. So I'll pass those around if you want. And then here's an example of another thing you can do with sweetgrass. It's a sweetgrass basket. And a friend of mine uh, wove this for me. And it smells so good. So you can take one of those and then just pass the basket. Did you guys all get kind of a whiff? Okay, and you definitely will with the braids. And, I, and and again, that's why I like to start, just for a settling peace of mind. And I really hope that it does that for you guys too. Um, sweet grass is in the grass family, and that means its cousins are like buffalo grass, wheat grass, barley, rye, oats, brome. Um, as such, it's the most cultivated and most globally distributed um, group of flowering plants in the world. It's found on all seven continents. Um, so it's widely used. I mean, it's widely available. Um, you know, I'm not sure how viable the grains would be, you know, if they, if they, if the seeds aren't really that coarse. So I don't know if they, if they would be um, very viable as far as a, a medicine or a, a nutritive really. Uh, like wheat in that same way, but I'm finding that there are really good things for the for the leaf properties. Um, anyway, it, it seems to be an only child, um, so there aren't that many varieties, if any, of sweetgrass. Um, the the most abundant constituent is coumarin. The most active constituents are ferulic acid and coumarin, and I will probably stop pronouncing constituents from here on. <laughs> I got those though. Um, and we know about coumarin, right? Uh, we learn about it. I learned about it in toxicology class and uh, people are scared of it. I think it's what gives the, the, um, the grass its vanilla-like flavor, but people are scared of it because, because of the anticoagulant results. Um, that can form if the grass turns wet and attracts a certain fungus and then turns into dicumarol. So from what I learned in toxicology class, the coumarin by itself is just fine. Does anyone have any, any corrections on that? Because people talk about coumarin and how it's dangerous, but I, I believe that unless it turns into dicumarol, it's a safe, it's a safe constituent, more or less. I think you're correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if I am, I'm going to credit Dr. Maximov because he's a great professor. <laughs> um, anyway, so here's here's just the kind of rundown on what I looked for in, in the plants. Traditional use, herbal use, nutritional use, aromatherapeutic use, home homeopathy um, uses, wildlife benefits, toxic, toxicological notes, and just one research example. And in the slides, the, the research examples are referenced. So um, traditionally, we've already seen that it can be used as an air purifier, a, a spirit calmant. Um, it can be used as an insect repellent. So you can take, like I take these braids or put them in sachets or just as braids and put them in my dresser drawers because they keep away bugs. Um, they are antimicrobial. In herbal medicine, they've been used as stomach aches because they calm they calm the stomach in a tea. In the food and beverage industry, that's one thing in my studies I learned that it's a huge industry. Um, many, many dollars go into it. And I did find that um, not only are essential oils going into so many different flavorings, which is one reason I want to advocate for aromatherapy safety in the United States. Um, but I'm learning like sweetgrass is used in the food and beverage industry. So unless you know that and do, or do some digging, you might not even know that you've been exposed to this, you know, hopefully in a good way. Um, as far as wildlife goes or in home, homeopathy, I didn't find any uses for or mention of sweetgrass and homeopathy. But homeopathy is so broad that I think the sky's the limit. So if some of these um, benefits work in some modalities, my guess is that we could find a way in homeopathy to also have a remedy that way. Um, let's see, wetland restoration is important because sweetgrass, you know, instead of cropland, farmers are being encouraged to protect wetlands. Sweetgrass is, is, thrives in like a, a more moist soil and it's something that also purifies the groundwater. So if you have sweet grass there in a wetland, it's good for the wildlife, it's good for the soil, and it's good for the water, which is ultimately good for all of us. Um, in research, you know, I've seen I've seen mention of it being anti an antioxidant and free radical scavenger, and those are just examples. Like for most of these, for most of these plants. There's countless, again, there's countless uses, and there's a lot more research than just what I'm mentioning here. Um, as an idea for a formulary and how you might use sweetgrass at home, well, you can make a braid. Um, and if you have some to harvest, um, they generally recommend you dry it, and then when you're ready to braid it, put it in water for a little bit, um, dry it off, braid it up, and then and then dry it before you store it or pop it in your dresser. Any thoughts on sweetgrass before I move on? I really hope you like it. I mean, if nothing else, I was able to give you something today and, and help yourself to more than one if you if you if you would like. Okay, um, eastern red cedar, as I mentioned before, is kind of considered a pest. If you look at hillsides as you're driving down the interstate in that in that landscape, which just looks like grass, you can see, if you focus your eyes, hundreds of little eastern red cedar trees on the bluffs of South Dakota. And um, I've done that, and at the same time, been listening to the radio where scientists are calling it, you know, a monster and something we a problem that we need to deal with and like a lot of these plants what I'm finding is that it used to be planted to make pencils to send to Germany for example I have a question over here Julie well because you're discussing native plants yes was was this brought in uh, a long time ago to plant as you were talking about for pencils or has it become what they consider more of a nuisance plant because we've done something to the environment to destroy whatever it is that keeps it in check? In check, right. Well, all of the plants that I used, the NRCS, and I have the list back there, listed as native or introduced to South Dakota. 
not native or introduced. Some of them were native and introduced, like the nettle, I believe. I, I mentioned nettle. Um, that, the NRCS list says native and introduced, um, but native was good enough for me, you know, because that's where we wanted to start, or that's where I wanted to start. Um, Eastern red cedar is known as Eastern red cedar in South Dakota. However, it's a juniper. It's just a cousin to the common juniper. So I've started calling it juniper. You know, it's our local juniper. You can use the berries as, you know, gin flavoring and it's not berries, it's cones, but they're delicious. You can make syrups out of it. And you, the, the pencils, I mean, it was encouraged like, like hemp, you know, it was encouraged to grow and now all of a sudden we don't want anything to do with it. You know what I mean? Not that I don't think hemp is a native plant in South Dakota. I could be wrong. Anyway, I've got a couple branches here from the tree outside my yard. And I did thank, thank it for letting me trim it. But I thought that if I could just show you the, the branch, you've got the wood there, you've got the leaf there, you've got the berry there. Cone. Um, this juniper is, did that answer your question, first of all? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Because I'm trying to figure out when it became, when it went, when it went boom. a native plant to a nuisance plant. You know what? I, in my opinion, and this is something that I'd research if I could or would, or maybe I will, but in my opinion, it's just a matter of attention span. You know, wow. we found something, people found something better than cedar to make pencils out of. And so we just kind of left it by the wayside, literally. <laughs> um, and, and you see that with, with plants. You know, they're encouraged to grow and then all of a sudden we find something else and leave it alone and then it keeps growing and lo and behold, then we find it a pest, you know. So it is, it was, it has been native to South Dakota, but I think it was encouraged and then dropped for shinier objects. Um, let's see. So it's the, uh, the Eastern red cedar is from the Cypress family. Its cousins are spruce and pine. Um, it's an evergreen tree. It's aromatic. Um, the berries are actually cones. And it's got siblings within the species, uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper, the Common Juniper, the Dwarf and Creeping Juniper. Uh, and here is, you know, just the first eight or so list of the most abundant constituents and the most active constituents. And again, the reason I did this was to kind of highlight synergy. And I hope that it does that for you because not one single constituent is doing anything all on its own, if that makes sense. So you have tannin over here as one of the most abundant constituents, but over here it's just kind of down the list. So synergy says to me, well, we have activity, a lot of activity, togetherness. Um, the constituents is a, is a way of you know, I try, I try not to talk about individual constituents too much because it's a way of sort of singling out chemicals. And I think that's not good for us ultimately. Too much of one thing is never good. So, um, and with the synergy with all of these um, herbs, they work together. But to give you an idea of what's in there and kind of what's moving around the most, I'm giving you these. So. Um, as far as uses go, I've got respiratory aid highlighted. So if nothing else, you can look at that as a traditional medicinal use for Eastern red cedar. Um, I've seen where it is burned or where it's smoked um, for better breathing. Uh, cedar chests have been made out of juniper, or Eastern red cedar for hundreds of years. Um, I would like to learn how or get the, if I, if I could have, I would have made coffee for everybody today. I would have figured out how to roast the, roast the seeds and grind it up. I had some success with that in sumac, by the way, but which was awesome, but <laughs> I didn't quite get the recipe perfect. And I would like to learn how to make the coffee substitute. Um, otherwise in food and beverage, it's been used in flavorings, um, there is a homeopathic remedy called Juni V. 
Um, that's good for kidneys and the urinary tract. It's an excellent winter habitat um, for like the cedar waxwing and um, it's good for white-tailed deer. Um, now, also, I, you know, I was talking about constituents and, and too much of a good thing. Well, another thing I like to think of in herbal medicine or really in anything is two notions that I combine uh, into one. My father-in-law used to say that everything is a medicine. We've heard that anything could be a poison. So, so I like to look at it like everything is a medicine until it becomes a poison, basically. So juniper is great for a very, very, very many number of reasons. However, it's also been used in the past to create or to cause abortion. You know, too much or used in the wrong way is not a good thing. One thing I didn't state out loud also is that I am not here to prescribe anything. I don't, you know, I'm not here as medical advice. I'm just taking what I have learned from people, what I have studied in class, and introducing seven plants to you. So anyway, don't take it as medical advice. Learn, learn more. <laughs> um, I, I like the research example. The potophyllotoxin that's found in eastern red cedar is good for, um, it's an anti-carcinogenic carcinogenic and it's antifungal. So I've seen uses of it being used like on warts, for example. Um, and while I couldn't find the perfect coffee, I did find a gin kind of flavored regular coffee that is not really infused with gin, but it does have juniper, cardamom, and a couple other herbs in it. And I think it looks delicious and I'd love to try it. So. Hopefully it just gets your mind working as to, you know, what this is and ways I can use it. Smooth sumac, I've mentioned here or there. And I, I haven't been practicing. Let's see. Here's some sumac. Sumac is in the cashew family. Um, it's that's included with cashews, mangoes, pistachios, poison oak, poison ivy, I think have been broken off into a different family by now. Um, but they are closely related. Uh, this is a stand, stand of sumac. Um, they can be viney, they can be shrubby, they can be trees, but they have droop fruit, as you'll see. I guess I could show it on camera too, but have some droops like this that I'm passing around for people to look at. Some of the uh, siblings within the species of smooth sumac are desert dwarf, fragrant, and staghorn sumac. Here's the comparison of constituents again. The several that are found the most in, you know, from the most down, although again, there's there are hundreds. Um, and then the few that are the most active. Uh, one of the best uses for sumac is as an astringent. Um, traditionally, it's been used for many things, um, for pediatric aid, for dye, as um, food flavoring, meat flavoring. I would like to also figure out how to make some steak tips with juniper and sumac as a rub. I think that would be really good. Uh, yeah. So anyway, it's also got antimicrobial. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Antimicrobial functions, capacities, properties. There it is. Yeah, and, and I think my... Um, formulary here is a, a sumac aid and basically you just cold cold soak the sumac for 20 you know, the berries for like 24 plus hours and it makes it good uh, gut aid and um, antimicrobial anyway in, in aromatherapy or traditionally it has been smoked like with tobacco um, maybe not as an aromatherapeutic per se but that is one way to use it uh, let's see, it's important for pollinators, butterflies, birds. There's the droop. Yeah, and if you pop one in your mouth, it, like, 
uh, to me, there's not much there, but the longer you let it steep, the the more the more sour and the better flavor you get. So I've got some at home right now. In a couple of days, I'm gonna go home and try that again. You know. Uh, let's see. As with anything that could be a poison or a medicine, it should be taken in moderation, short duration. Pay attention to what you're doing. Learn how these these herbs work and the plants work together and with you and in your environment. Um, I've we've seen some of the same properties of the sumac being used in like thyme or oregano for food packaging for killing foodborne illness. So I'm wondering if there's a potential or if there's research out there for sumac and food packaging. And there might be some out there, but the research that I specifically found talked about its antimicrobial properties that just didn't take, the, take it a step farther in the food packaging. So all of them have potential. Um, here's the aid. Here's the sumac lemonade kind of. And basically it's just let it soak. Try it with different different herbs. And this time of year, the, the warm fall, maybe a couple of weeks ago, would probably be the best time to do that, where it's hot and the berries are ripe and you could use a pick-me-up and uh, maybe a little winter prep. Okay, let's see. I've got some purple bee balm here. There's, I'll save Andy the trouble this time. There's the camera. There's a little, little dried flower that looks just like that. <laughs> it's also known as wild oregano, which I think you'll be able to find that out if you take a whiff. It's one of those, it's one of those medicinals I like to use just in my everyday cooking, like Italian, Italian cooking or um, in a salad. Are you guys familiar with bee balm? Yeah, and using it as a, a savory herb. Yeah, good. It's also a really good pollinator, too. So anyway, it comes from the mint family, so it is aromatic. Um, cousins include hyssop, motherwort, mint itself, salvia. Um, and typically, the members of the mint family have square stems. It's just one of those little things that I don't know if everybody has heard before. Um, species siblings are like basil, bee balm, spotted bee balm, and lemon mint. Um, it's got some great constituents in there. Some that uh, most people have probably heard of. The thymol, for sure, that, that's also antibacterial. Some uses, uh, kind of like the sweet grass, it could be used to rejuvenate, to put you at ease, but maybe with a little bit more energy and not necessarily by burning it, but by using it as in a tea. Um, it's good for your stomach. It's got great essential oil um, properties or value. There's um, another species that's been used more in essential oils than the purple. Um, the fistulosa, I guess. Uh, so that's one where, like I ordered Monarda, Monarda is another name for it. I ordered Monarda essential oil and it came from Montana, but it wasn't this kind and they got it from somewhere else. So I'm thinking to myself, this great company in Montana could grow the kind that's native to the area. I don't know if it's native in Montana, but you see what I'm saying? Like I, they outsourced it and then I got it from them and then so-and-so delivered it to me. So anyway, that's one example of uh, a cousin species that could just as well be used here rather than searching abroad for it. Okay, so um, the thymol repels mosquitoes, I found out, and then it's also good for the kidney. Here's an herb salad that I adapted. Uh, it's also got sumac in it. It originally called for fresh oregano, but I'm using wild oregano instead. Common milkweed is um, in the milkweed family. Um, it has great smelling flowers, many, many cousins. Um, 
And then within the same species, the Asclepius, there's antelope horns, and then there's like prairie, swamp, dwarf milkweed, butterfly milkweed, lots of things that we recognize as uh, medicinal and valuable. Um, the common milkweed, uh, along with other milkweeds, is the only place like where the monarch butterflies lay their eggs, and they use when they're uh, migrating from North to South, or North North America to Mexico and California. So milkweed along the way is great for wildlife. Um, it's also a plant that's revered across cultures, as many of these are, and then have somehow become forgotten. So let's see, abundant constituents. You can use it as a nutritive. You have to be careful. You have to boil it, reboil it. Um, but look at right there, the one of like the, according to Dr. Dukes, the most abundant constituent is protein. So and then there's a few of the more active constituents. I mentioned some of the uses. Um, it's great in homeopathy um, as a cardiac aid. That's one to really take take into consideration and maybe study more. Um, the flowers are really good smelling. Uh, let's see, and then we're talking about cardiac glycosides in the research, meaning good for the heart and even toward or against breast cancer. A couple ideas for the milkweed, the, the homeopathic remedy, that's just one of the indications to use it. Um, or one of the older books, like kind of like the ones we see here that are hundreds of years old or 100 or 200 years old, calls for using it as a, plea, a flea dispellent. And you take a couple stalks, which are usually taller than this, and as a broom, sweep the room. I've seen a mattress company in Nebraska using the silk from the pods as a uh, stuffing along with goose down. Thinking nettle, probably if I had to choose one of these, and I've said before, this is one of the most useful because it starts with being um, delicious to cook and very nutritious to eat. Um, it was once in the same family as elm and cannabis. And if you start to look at the plants, especially with the cannabis and the nettle, they have a lot, or the hemp and the nettle, they have a lot of commonalities. You can use the stems as cordage, make it into linens. Um, and, it's, and it's readily abundant, it's, it's in, in our area anyway. I think a dried nettle has about 40% protein. And I've got some here in half long. Leafy green. And again, I'll mention that it's extremely nutritious. Um, one thing I learned from an ethnobotanist named Linda Black Elk, and I referenced her work, and I have a copy of one of her books here for anybody who'd like it, um, is that you can kind of whip yourself with it. The sting will help relieve things like. Um, rheumatism. It will also sting you for sure, but another thing that helps you get rid of the sting is like a nettle decoction. So nettle will help you alleviate its own sting. It's one it's one to really learn more about and honestly keep it around. I've seen that you can keep it in your kitchen. I've got some growing for the winter just to see if I can maybe pick some leaves off of it and see how that works. So Definitely not a popular a popular thing to just talk to people about, but nettle is really good for you. Um, it's good to have around and it could could do things like like uh, help you make clothes. So here's a hair rinse with a few other herbs in it. And then horsetail, I'm going to finish up with like the oldest, most ancient herb on our list. Uh, horsetail grew in stands of 100-foot plants right next to the dinosaurs. Horsetail makes up 
most of the coal in our earth, things I've learned. Um, yeah, and there's some dried horse tail. I couldn't get any, any uh, grasses to come with me today, but ACHS in the apothecary shop does have dried horse tail. And it smells like a grass. It makes a nice easy tea with the sweet grass or with the Minarda, with the bee balm. It's very good. Um, or you can let it grow and out of its younger juvenile state and scrub scrub wood with it or scrub pots with it. And it's also known as like scouring rush. Um, most abundant constituent is water, but there's lots of fiber in there too. And then the active constituents there. Um, I would say because it's got silica in it, it is good first and foremost as for your connective tissue. Um, kind of like bone set might be, but it would be good at building, building your connective tissue. There is a homeopathic remedy that is horsetail. Um, and not native in South Dakota are grizzly bears, but I did find it interesting that one of the staple foods for the grizzlies of Yellowstone is horsetail. And then here's a nourishing herbal snack that I also got from the apothecary shop. The recipe I did, I took that right off the line. Not all of the ingredients were available um, to me, um, and they were they were sold out at, at a couple different uh, herbal shops. So I'm hesitant to use something where there's not enough enough of it. Otherwise, I was going to make these bars for you. I have lots of plans, but I was going to make these little snacks for you and bring them in and feed everyone and give you juniper coffee. So anyway, if you want these recipes, let me know if you want the PowerPoint notes. Um, I, I guess it's already been said, contact ACHS for more information. Um, in conclusion, uh, I picked a grouping of plants that I hope you um, feel like you kind of know or can approach and get to know more about that will be beneficial to you and living alongside you in your neighborhood. My formulary going forward, um, or my advice to anyone is just to look around because chances are what you need is just right, right at your feet within, within a few foot radius. If you're really paying attention to the plants of your neighborhood, there's no reason to shop online or drive across town or use that coal up that that horse, <laughs> horse tail provided in order to move things around the planet. You really could be self-sufficient if you just um, learn what's around you. And my, my uh, active steps in that is to seek out the plants that are native to the area in which you live, um, learn their traditional uses. They've been going on for thousands of years, um, become familiar with them, be partners, active partners with the plants, animals, earth, and people of your environment, and then um, become self-sustainable in the least that you can identify it, if not sustainably wildcraft or um, garden it yourself. So. And I've left 22 seconds for questions. Nothing online. Really? Not one, but your daughter did support you and say, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thank you, Matea. <laughs> uh, really, we do have like a minute, a minute or two left. So did you guys have any comments or did anything not make sense to you? Serene? Well, that's a, that was a, a very interesting, innovative presentation. It was really great. Um, I love the fact that you took uh, one plant, in fact you did this with all of your plants, but you took one plant and thought about um, the different ways it can be used. Um, you know, for example, homeopathy, um, an essential oil, uh, etc., etc. Um, this is something I'm also very interested in, and I think a lot of it is about. Um, you know, where the constituents are within the plant and then what solvents or what methodology can be used to extract that. So one of the things we do in our Greek study board program is um, we take the, the local plants and we prepare, uh, 
you know, if, if they're an aromatic plant, we would uh, distill it. We would also tincture it. We would also prepare oh, cool. a flower essence. And um, if possible, uh, if the aroma would come to, into a, a base oil, we would also make an infused product. Uh -huh. So, you know, you can take it to that level as well. Of course, if you're going to work with it as an energetic medicine, like in homeopathy, uh, you would want to take, for example, the texture and then uh, reduce that down, dilute it significantly and succuss it. And, and make a, a more energetic frequency, um, you know, medicine. But um, I just love the fact that you're thinking along those lines. It's, it's, it's so much fun. I mean, you can really get a tremendous amount from one plant. Yeah. And I love to also use the plant to grow around me. Yeah. So good job. Thank you. And <laughs> Please. Uh, both rusting nettle and horsetails are amazingly abundant in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't wild crafted a uh, horsetail, but I wild craft seen nettles every early spring. And uh, there's places where it's, the woods are just full of it. You can walk in there, walk a shopping bag, mm -hmm. where, oh, wow. and, and walk out and it's like we're never there. Mm -hmm. There's just wow. so much of it. And uh, it's, I make tea out of it, I dry it, I make tinctures of it, and uh, I, use mm -hmm. the, I use the herb, I use the roots, I use the seeds, and it's really, I think, uh, it, I think it's my favorite herb, my favorite wild herb. Honestly, I, I've, I, it's called like so many wonderful things in the literature, and, and, and you get all these ancient texts talking about nettle, you know, and here we are, like, Trying our best to kill it, you know. I like it. I like the sweat of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's just work on that. Okay. I'm actually at the fiber all spin it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I've really. I've actually yeah. seen that in, in uh, Greece. They make nettle fiber yeah. um, clothing. I really wanted and to go on that trip. This yeah. Trip. It lasts forever. Yeah. It's just one of the best fibers there is, but it's labor intensive to, to get it. Fiber and, and spin it. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. Well, and I, it, and kind of like some of these other things, it used to be used more prevalently until you know, like cotton came along. You know, mm -hmm. so I do like the blends where where you can do blends of milkweed and goose down, for example, or mm -hmm. cotton with nettle. That would work too. Well, nettle is a highly nutritious plant as well. And so during the Second World War in Europe, um, particularly for a lot of the uh, Jewish people who, you know, for example, escaped into the forest or yeah. were able to get away, um, they, I, I've heard firsthand from some of those survivors that nettle was the plant that really kept them alive. And do you think it was trial and error or do you think that was something that people knew about beforehand? I think traditionally it's been used for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've even seen um, uh, references to it back in Hippocrates' work. So. I just throw it in my vegetarian lasagna with oh. spinach. Oh, spinach. And they say you can eat it. It won't sting you after it's dried, but it still kind of irritates me, and I think I would cook it before I mm -hmm. heat it up a little bit before I eat it. But thank you guys for bearing with me and being my teachers and my compatriots, comrades. What am I looking for? Students. With me. <laughs>